everyone. My name is Kat Savage and I'm a professional artist, clinical hypnotherapist and well-being expert working with those in the creative arts sector. In my line of work, I get to meet some amazing, colourful people from actors to artists, people who live their lives by their own rules, fueled by passion and determination to bring their unique talents into the world. I wanted to discover what it took for people to leave the usual nine to five and hop on a dream to capture their bravest moments and share these meaningful conversations with you so that together we can explore the ideas, emotions and moments that could potentially change our lives too. So let's keep talking, have some fun and enjoy the show. This week on the show, we speak to the creator of Let's Explore magazine, the first ever When Ready publication designed and created by Killian Itzinger. To create his magazine, Killian collaborates with people from all over the world, inviting stories from a diverse group of inspiring people with the intention of creating a meaningful publication in a mindful manner, with each issue themed to a human experience such as belonging, empowerment or endurance, for instance. On the show, Killian tells us what he learns in the process of his creation, how creating content for a magazine doesn't have to be meaningless, and how each collaboration teaches him something new about the world and also his role within it. It is with great pleasure that I introduce you to this innovative and fascinating storyteller, Killian Isinger. Killian from Let's Explore magazine. How are you? Hi, uh, I'm very good. Thank you so much. <laughs> how has your lockdown been and how are you feeling coming out of it? It's uh, actually been kind of okay for me. It uh, it has given me the opportunity to uh, do a lot more than I was used to. So uh, I'm somewhat ashamed to say that um, this entire situation has been uh, very fruitful for me. <laughs> I don't think you're the only one that that thinks that though, because I know like from my perspective, even though um, I feel empathetic towards the situation uh, in terms of creativity and things like that, it's it's been really great. It's been a really good space to explore ideas, hasn't it? It has. And what helped me a lot was that I'm not spending two hours a day on my commute Oh, nice. (laughs) And instead of using that time to sleep in, for instance, I'm using it to my benefit in terms of creative activities or uh, just working out stuff like that. So it's been uh, it's been actually pretty great. Oh, I'm really pleased to hear that. It's nice to know that you've had a good time uh, during what could have been something very, very tragic. So that's that's a good thing. Um, so you are the brainchild behind Let's Explore magazine. So how do you feel our stories sort of connect us and why do you think it's important to document them? Stories, I think, are incredibly important for well, basically us as a species, it's been the way we've learned from one another. We learned about what dangers are and what, what you can do, what you cannot do, uh, where you can travel, uh, stuff like that. So it's been at the foundation of us surviving. So mm. stories in that sense uh, are hugely important. Um At the moment, we see that stories can be used for good, but also for bad intentions. And... I feel that stories provide context. Mm. So what with whatever question one asks, you always have to know what the context of that question is because mm. otherwise you can give an answer which doesn't make any sense at all. And I think stories help provide that context in terms of the question as well as the answer. Just coming out of the lockdown, well, in England anyway, I don't know how it's affecting you over there. Um, I think it's been really, really important that we've all had this same story for the last 12 months. I really feel like personally it's it's been quite cathartic in terms of having a lot of time to talk with friends about things that are slightly bigger than our everyday concerns. Um, but also it's a uniting story and it's created a lot of movements within the impact of it, such as, you know, the resurgence of like Black Lives Matter, Hearts Not Parts, um, the Me Too movement. It's 
it's given those other stories that need to rise up through this one a bit more space, hasn't it? It sure has. And I feel like, especially in the beginning when everything was still new and kind of exciting, mm. even if people don't want to admit that it was an exciting time in the beginning, um, <laughs> is that it tend to slow down life a little bit. Mm. So it gave, I think it gave people time to reflect on what was really important. And you saw that when people in health services actually got the attention that they deserved just because of the importance of their work. Mm. And I found that that was not only in, in health uh, situation, but in general, I found that people were more aware of what they found was really important. And the longer it took for stuff to get under control, if they are under control at the moment, I <laughs> I cannot say anything about that but, because I'm not an expert, but I think it's taking too long and people are starting to become anxious again and want something new. And that's something of this time, I believe. Mm -hmm. So people are looking for this slowness. That's why I think print, printed magazines, for instance, are thriving again. Mm -hmm. They are looking for ways to connect more with other people or with nature uh, for that matter. Mm -hmm. But they still have this urge to constantly go, go, go. Yeah. And I do feel that because things aren't changing fast enough at the moment, people get a little bit anxious and are tired of waiting, actually. <laughs> Yeah, there's a real frustration, isn't there? Especially with this particular lockdown, I think, in terms of wanting to go back to the life that you had before. But equally, um, for those of us that have had really busy lives, looking at the avalanche of the energy that's about to bombard us again once things do get up and running. So it is a really curious space and that kind of slow is beautiful mentality, which... Um, is a, is a sentiment shared not only by us, but also by our mutual friend, Brian Fitzgerald at Dancing Fox. Um, they actually did a, a campaign through, uh, through the lockdown uh, called We Were Made For These Times. And one of their slogans or one of the themes that came up from that is slow is beautiful. And you're absolutely right. It's it's this time for reflection, but also it's amplified people's emotions and it's really sort of made people have to look in the mirror at themselves and go, you know, what's important to me now? What really is the bare bones of my life and how can I reconstruct that into a new way of being? It's been a really interesting time. <laughs> Ab abs absolutely, especially because we're kind of forced to look at ourselves mm. because you cannot project your own emotions to somebody else because you're, well, you're locked down into your, in between your own four walls. I mean, you have to <laughs> deal with yourself and you can connect with others through socials or uh, telephone or video conference calls, but it's, there's nothing like an in-person connection. And well, we're that person with whom we are having a connection when we're at home alone or mm. with our family. And I think that's really the mirror that perhaps we need mm. because um, I am I believe that society in a sense, well, I don't want to make it too big of a thing, but <laughs> it, it kind of spun out of control. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there, yeah. there was so much going on all the time. And with many things that are new or are evolving, I feel that they hit a climax and then they normalize again. Yeah. And yeah. I think that we're at this moment in time at that uh, exact crossroad where we are figuring out what is important to us and things start to normalize again. At least that's what I hope. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you never know what will happen. But <laughs> and that's the beauty of life, isn't it? <laughs> exactly, exactly. You never know. You never know. Talking of connection and talking about slowing down and creating beautiful things and looking at ourselves in the mirror, I want to talk to you a little bit about your incredible magazine, Let's Explore magazine, which... Um, I know is a when ready magazine, which is something you can explain to us in a minute. But your magazine is 
so beautiful and it explores themes as opposed to sort of articles on specific things uh, that that don't make any sense. And that's what I, I was really drawn to with it. And I know that your up and coming magazine is, is based in the term empowerment and what empowerment means to people in general, which I think is such a beautiful idea. Um, but I want to know how this beautiful creation came to be because I know it started as a bit of a passion project um but yeah how how did you come up with the idea for it and what inspired you so um it it first off it's it's still a passion project that's my intention to keep it that way so uh, I've made some decisions in the past just to make sure that it stayed uh, a passion project mm. I'm a graphic designer by trade mm-hmm and I specialized in editorial design, so uh, the design of magazines and books and later on also websites. But no matter what, the specialization is very story-based. So I'm looking uh, into ways to present content, um, mm. whether it's in a magazine or in a book or on a website, just so that it's easiest for the reader to uh, absorb Mm. So that's my role as a designer, where I believe strongly that content is always first and it informs the way the design should look. And I'm a very eager to learn type of person. So I thought, <laughs> well, what can I do to make uh, all these things come together? And back then, which was around seven years ago, I think, uh, I wasn't that into web design yet. Uh, I still believed that print was the one thing to go with. Mm. But discovering something new, I thought, well, why not create a website and learn from that and see where that will go. But when designing a website, you also need content. <laughs> <laughs> so I needed content. And I started interviewing people uh, who did what I thought inspiring things or they uh, had a nice uh, travel journal going on or they ran a company which inspired me. Just me being curious to find out what made them tick to make uh, them uh, do what they were doing. Mm. I was able to uh, pick up another hobby which was photography and I shot portraits of them, documented their workspace, stuff like that. But it was always in the beginning, something to fill the website with. But going on those interviews and connecting with people, I found that it really fascinated me how everybody had an interesting story, no matter what their background was. I mean, it's not just the pioneers that have an interesting story to tell when it comes to what they are doing. I mean, it can also be somebody who's been doing the same thing for 40 or 50 years he has a story as well. And that's something that dawned on me when I was creating those interviews and the website. So what is it that you sort of gain emotionally from from creating it? And I know that you've you've touched on the fact that you want to sort of represent stories from everywhere, from all around the globe. But what is it that you gain being the creative behind the scenes and, and having it for your own thing as opposed to creating it for someone else? Yes. Yeah, so what happened uh, next after launching the website was that I wanted to create the printed magazine. I mean, that's where my biggest love was and actually still is. Mm. So I, uh, with the, within the community that I created around the website, I reached out to people uh, and asked them if they were interested in sharing their take on a theme for a printed publication. And luckily, a lot of them said yes. So they were <laughs> writing their own story in their words without an, uh, any intervenience uh, uh, from my part. Mm. And they submitted those stories and I created the magazine and I launched a Kickstarter campaign to actually publish the magazine. And that's where my gain actually started my emotional gain, because from that moment on, I thought, OK, I've created this one issue, but I had incredible f uh, fun making it. And <laughs> I got to meet a lot of people from all over the world <laughs> with different points of views regarding the same theme. And that made me think of, well, how far can I take this? Hmm. So that was the start of me 
being more attentive to what my personal life looked like because mm. I was looking for new themes. So the easiest way to talk with other people about a certain theme is if the theme is close to your own heart. Mm. So I was really f reflecting on what was going on in my own life and selecting a theme which was important to me or something that I struggled with and then just asking other people, well, what do you think of this theme? What does it do to you? What does it mean for you? And do you know other people who uh, perhaps have something, in something interesting to say about it or perhaps nothing at all? Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm noticing with the, the issue I'm working on right now is that I have a certain notion of a theme, but you never know uh, what other people think. And I actually came across a few people who had a completely different point of view. And I, that's, that's what I gained from this uh, entire exploration, so to say, that I'm gaining insight in what people are thinking about the same uh, subject matter. And that's fascinating. And just hearing you talking about it, I can't imagine what it must have felt like to start receiving those stories and reading them for the first time, knowing that you are becoming sort of this collective storyteller um, under that umbrella or that theme that you were creating. How how did you feel when those stories started coming in? How did you connect to to that situation? It must have been very exciting. It it's it's a crazy situation because you <laughs> you have you have an idea. That's where it starts. And you put that idea out there, which is already kind of a leap to take because, well, you're putting yourself out there. And then have people re, um, respond to that with their own stories and their own takes and mentioning other people that I should be talking to. It's like re, uh, regaining faith in, in humanity in a sense that people are willing to share what's going on in their lives and not only the good things that you see on Instagram, for instance. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, un, it's unpolished and putting my out, myself out there and being vulnerable in a sense, they returned that favor to me because I actually had a few people sending in stories that I had to ask and ask again whether or not they were absolutely okay with me publishing the story because it was such a personal take on a theme like Crossroads or Belonging that mm. I figured, well, the people all over the world are going to read this story. Are you absolutely sure you want me to publish this? Mm. And they said, absolutely no questions asked. Mm. And that's just, that's insane. I still can't wrap my head around reactions like that. And similar with um, the fact that with each, each issue and each theme, I have this wish list of people who I would like to have in the magazine. <laughs> fully aware, that being fully aware of the fact that they probably will say no because they're just too busy or too big of a name and they don't want to get involved <laughs> with this small publication. <laughs> But I'm just so surprised that there are, with each issue, there's people who are, without hesitating, are willing to collaborate. Even if it's not, it's just for them, it's a creative outlet. And I, and I get that. And that's also what I want to offer. But just the sheer enthusiasm of people that I didn't expect a yes from, uh, that they are participating is just unbelievable. That's something that I can actually relate to quite personally, obviously doing the podcast and things like that. And being that it's a, a fairly new podcast, we're only on our, our third season at the moment. But having that that nervousness almost about reaching out to people that you consider to be like you rightly say, like too big of a name or that you think, well, maybe they're not going to be interested in what you're doing, but they seem to be the most responsive. And, and in some ways it must be so refreshing for these people to contribute to something that is authentically them, that represents them in a way that they want to be represented as opposed to how they have to be represented. And therefore, what you're putting out into the world becomes even more authentic. And I think that's what you're talking about with having that faith in humanity again, because you realize that actually everyone is just trying to live their life and understand it. <laughs> I, I think you're absolutely right there. And I think it's it in certain ways, it also has to do with us being in this red race 
where mm. people are doing what they think others expect them to do. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're just going, going, going and getting this uh, freedom of, well, here's 10 pages, do whatever you want. Because <laughs> that's basically my brief to them. There's no, <laughs> there's no style guide in writing or photography. I mean, it's your story. Mm. Uh, the, the publication is just facilitating the collection of stories. And I want those stories to be authentically them. So I'm asking them questions along the way, but I'm not writing the stories because it's not my story to write. It's theirs. That's so refreshing because I think a lot of people might feel intimidated about writing into a magazine, um, especially when you're sort of bombarded with so many of them on on the shelves, because you you do believe or you have this illusion in your head that in order to write a story, you must be a writer or you must have some credential in writing. But sometimes the most beautiful stories that we create could be, you know, just a single picture on someone's phone, or it could be, you know, a 10 year old child exploring the theme of some or something like that and those are the stories that we warm to because they have that emotion behind it that maybe when you're thinking about the technical or the technical side of story you can almost rub out the emotional sentiment behind it because you're trying so hard to get the the technique or the grammar of the story correct that you actually forget the authenticity of the story itself so it's lovely to, to think that, you know, you're probably the only magazine editor on the planet that's going, you know what, write your own story. I can't tell it for you. <laughs> I, th I think it um, it has to do with what I mentioned before. It's, it's that context. Mm. I mean, nobody can tell your story better than you alone. I mean, of course, there are people who are perfectly capable of conveying the emotion and stuff like that. But... You, ha you are the one who has lived the story. Mm -hmm. So I truly believe that you should be the one telling it as well. And if that means that you need help from somebody who will ask you questions to get your mind going, that's perfectly fine. But even when somebody cannot find the right words and is looking for those words in their writing or hesitant or stuttering when they answer a question it's what makes the story real yeah and i think that's extremely hard to capture when you're focusing on the technicality of writing yeah and i'm sure there's a lot of writers out there who can capture it but <laughs> that's without that's outside of my budget range <laughs> Talking of budget and things like that, it's a When Ready magazine. And when I was sort of Googling, you know, what does When Ready magazine mean? Yours was the only one that came up. <laughs> and this was very curious to me. Um, so what I'd love you, love you to do is just to explain to us what does that mean? And why is it important for you to have it as a When Ready magazine? So the, the reason why it's a When Ready magazine is twofold. And I only came up with the, the wording of this concept uh, with the second reason. So the first reason is very practical. I have a full-time job. Mm. So there is no way I can promise a quarterly or a biannual magazine just because I don't know how my life is going. Because <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> So I don't want to make that commitment and then have to disappoint people. Mm. And disappointment goes both to people who read, uh, but also to, for instance, advertisers. So that made me make the decision that I don't have any advertising in there. Mm. Because I cannot promise uh, when it's coming out. But what I've found while creating the first issue and even more so with the second issue is that I really don't want time to be a constraint on the quality of the stories. And I'm asking people to send in their stories and the people who are writing or creating the story um, do this besides their full-time job as well. So I'm imposing on their free time. And who am I to then ask for them or push them to deliver uh, on a certain amount of time or within a certain amount of time? I 
could. I, I mean, I mean, I'm I'm still asking people to deliver on time, but I'm putting the ball in their court for them to deliver to be able to create their story on the time that they need. And it, it's not like you're giving them just like a couple of weeks, is it? You're giving them months of time to to create and remind themselves of that story. So it's, yes. it's not, it, you don't feel that pressure to perform for you or, or anything like that. It just seems to be that you're like, right, okay, this is the theme. Um, you do have this much time and it's a, it's a good amount of time, a comfortable amount of time. And then people can just write that in that time frame, can't they? Offering people uh, the time to be able to create what they want comes with a downside because still most people work towards a deadline. Mm. So whether it's uh, a week from now or two months from now, they will deliver their story nine out of ten times on the last day. Oh, no. Or, <laughs> or, or the morning after the last day. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a problem. Because mm. I cannot sleep. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm making it sound a little bit worse than it is. Because <laughs> I trust I trust the fact that things will work out eventually. Even if they don't, they will. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a conviction that I have and a strong belief that no matter what happens, it will work, will work out one way or another. I love um, that. Even if they don't, they will. That's a, such a great <laughs> saying. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your mother because I know that you were very close to her and uh, that the magazine was kind of a, an inspiration, uh, almost a memento mori to, to her uh, and her influence on you. Tell us a little bit about your mother and, and w who she was as a person and why she was so influential in, in this decision. So my mother was um, was an artist herself. She painted and um, she did that as part of getting uh, of being part of Dutch culture because she's German and she married uh, my father who is uh, Dutch. Mm. So she used her drawing lessons to be part of the community, learn Dutch and um, Basically, that's where her passion for art grew. Uh, and she started teaching art uh, lessons as well. And so she's she's the creative uh, part of my, my family. Uh, even though that my father was... Um, he, could, he could draw a fair bit as well and make, uh, make music. So um, there was a lot of creativity in there. But my mom, she always did her thing. Mm. And no matter what the consequences were when it comes to creating. So she had a clear vision of what she was painting or an exhibition she was uh, creating for herself or classes she was designing. Uh, she had a clear vision and she asked people for their opinions and she worked with those opinions, but she always kept going. Mm. No matter what, no matter what other people thought or how hard it was to get somewhere. And she had a true sense of what was needed to get where she wanted to. She took that head on and basically she lived three lives at once because she was so active <laughs> in, in everything she was doing and not taking any half measures, even if she was um, designing an exhibition of her work and she knew that there was a catering company uh, making sure that there was enough food, for instance, she just knew intuitively that there wouldn't be enough. So <laughs> she spent two nights in the kitchen making sure that even if the catering company didn't deliver, she would have their backs without telling them. Wow. And, and, and nine out of 10 times her intuition was right. And I think I learned that from her to listen to myself and just to keep on going. That's an incredible thing to witness in another person that is part of your family, because often we we look outside for our inspirations, uh, don't we? And we don't really pay that much attention to to the people that are around us, maybe until they've passed away and we can sort of look at their lives in retrospect. But to, to see that growing up and to recognise it and to admire it and have that as one of your biggest inspirations, that must have been 
very impactful on you as a, as a teenager, as a, as a small person? Like how did, how did you feel when you were a child growing up with that presence in the house and how did it inspire you when you were a teenager? I'm still a very much a mama's boy <laughs> and I'm absolutely not ashamed to say that or to present myself in that way. I had a very special connection with my mom. Um, she passed away six years ago, a little over six years ago. Mm. And we just had this connection. There was a way of us communicating with each other without saying anything. Just a glance often was enough or the way our facial expressions were, we could we could have um, conversations across the room without anybody noticing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and um, that was powerful, but also frustrating mm. because we could sense from each other what was wrong with the other person, even though that they were telling us that there wasn't anything wrong. Yeah. And that's, I think, part of that intuition thing as well. Uh, but it also meant that we were almost unable to tell a white lie to each other because we just knew from the other person that that wasn't the entire truth. And that that created that very special bond, but it also created a way of... Um, well, manipulating is a very wrong, strong word in this, but <laughs> we knew we knew of each other what the other needed. That's beautiful. I love and that. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's a dangerous thing to know f of someone mm. because you can act upon it and get the stuff you want yourself. And. At a very early age, I think I was 16 or 17, my mom took me aside and she explained how she experienced that for herself within her own family mm. and her growing up. Uh, but she also explained how it worked in our relationship to one another. That's it. A very, very powerful, uh, and I'm just trying to think about it in terms of myself with my own mother, because I am very, very close. People say we're very similar people um, and we can read each other really, really well, but it's never, I don't think, well, I don't think so. I'll have to reflect on this a bit more from what <laughs> you've just said. I don't think we have um, sort of suggested or, I, I hate that word as well, manipulated each other um, <laughs> emotionally, but maybe we do. Power struggle is probably more the phrase I'm looking for with, with my mum. Um, but I can remember as a teenager, <laughs> we used to joke about it. Uh, she has a twin sister with two two daughters herself. And we used to joke about mum's um, starey eyes, which were the eyes of truth. And as a teenager, you know, I was testing a few boundaries when I was younger, as we all do. And uh, we'd come in from like, you know, a, a night night out on the town or something and we'd sneak into our rooms and then in the morning she'd be there with her starey <laughs> eyes and I couldn't lie to her I just couldn't lie to her and she just had this this power of just knowing I don't know it was <laughs> it was crazy but probably not on the on the same level that you were talking about there was definitely a boundary there between our intuitions I think that I mean I had my secrets of course I mean you're still a teenager and you will find your way to to have your own little things but <laughs> and I, I later found out that my dad actually knew of things I was doing but didn't tell anything <laughs> <laughs> Just to, to keep my mom a little bit in that space of <laughs> who she thought that I was, but he knew better. Mm. And that's just, that's that comes from them coming from different backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's funny stuff in, in hindsight. And it makes you realize how important a connection is and mm. that a certain connection uh, isn't necessarily something that has to be there continuously mm. because you have to step away from each other at some point as well. You have to do your own thing. Um, and even though I was still uh, a mama's boy, I did my own thing and she knew that and she let me be. And 
I always knew that she would be there in case I needed her. And she's and she's still there. I mean, I still talk to her every once in a while. That's good. And I think that's such a, a healthy thing to do, especially when someone has passed over in flesh, because I, and I'm the same. I talk to my Nana all the time, Nanny Val, shout out Nanny Val. Um, and especially if, if I've got a problem, I've got a saying with my cousin Kate, uh, what would Val do is our saying. And whenever I am in a predicament, I'll sit there and I'll go, what would Val do? I know I'll ask her. And, and nine times out of 10, there'll be that intuition intuition come through again uh, when you see through someone else's eyes or you connect with that energy once more. And it does put you back in that space where their advice would be prevalent and it would be present for you. Talking of which, you know, if she could see you today with your magazine, because I know that unfortunately she didn't get to see that happen for you. What do you think she would say about your journey and what advice would she give you going forward, do you think? I think she would be incredibly proud of what I've created. And it's something which I have strong feelings about when I'm working on the magazine is that, like you said, she never saw the first issue. It was mm. something that I was creating in my home office and didn't want to show it until it was ready for people to see, for other people to see. Mm. And even though she knew exactly how my creative journey would go because she experienced that when I was going to art school, I didn't want to see, want her to see it yet because it wasn't there yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I didn't want her creative mind to go and ask me questions before I was actually further in the process. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you postpone stuff like this it can bite you in the butt <laughs> and it did for me and uh, with each issue I have a hard time uh, realizing that she never uh, saw this uh, issue uh, mm. or the, the magazine come to come to life but I think that she would be very very proud of what I've done because I'm doing it my way mm. and not really compromising in any sense and I'm just doing this because I feel that this is the right thing to do. I think that's something that my mom has inspired in me to just keep doing what I'm doing because I want to do this and create this magazine in within my vision. I just love that that intuitive connection that you had with her is guiding you in some respects into how you are putting this magazine out into the world because it does feel, you know, when you're talking about it, um, you can clearly feel feel the passion and the energy that goes into it. But it does seem to be very intuitive what you're doing, how you're approaching, you know, just producing a magazine and, and changing that landscape completely to something that suits you and your energy and and in the consequence of that have become a pioneer which is a uh, which is amazing and I hope that you inspire other people to to produce when ready magazines as a consequence that are full of of actual content that that expands you as a person as opposed to just you know trashy content. <laughs> I'm trying, I was trying to think of a respectful way to say that, but I'm going to stand by that. <laughs> what do you think, uh, you, you know, talking with teenage Killian, what do you think he would think of what you do now? Do you think he'd be impressed or do you think he'd, he'd want you to be doing something different? I always found better things to do than to go to school. Mm. Um, well, at least I thought that those were better things to do. So <laughs> Spoken like a true creative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, my high school years, uh, I took a little bit longer um, to complete high school. But that way of working, just finding something and just sink my teeth in and go, mm. that is something that was already there when I was a teenager. And... Way back when I figured, well, I'm going to art school. I become an art director at a large creative agency <laughs> or uh, an advertisement agency, agency, travel the world, work internationally. And that's basically the only thing I want. So I'm going to make that happen. <laughs> that was my, uh, my intention. And uh, life has chosen differently for me. 
<laughs> and I can now say that I'm very happy with where I'm at hmm. uh, because what happened over the last couple of years, well, well 10, 15 years, made me into the person that I am now. And I am happy with who I am right now. Hmm. And the person who I was as a teenager made sure that my journey went the way it went mm. to become who I am now. Do you know, I, I was having this conversation with my husband not too long ago and I was thinking back on my life because I do love wondering about uh, about the guests that we have on the show and, and their childhoods um, for this exact reason that I look back on my own and I think, well, yeah, I might have some things that happened that I now would consider and I put in quote marks regrets um, or things that I didn't do. But then as you rightly say, if those things hadn't happened, if life hadn't happened to me in, in the way that it did, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today. And even though it wasn't what I planned, it's better because it feels right or it feels more connected to who I am as a person. Do you feel that connection uh, when you're working? Uh, absolutely. I mm. mean, and and the thing is that I've been doing what I wanted to do when I was in art school. So again, in art school, I had this intention of, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is what my job will look like. And this is uh, how life will look like. I had this idea. And in a way, I am living that life. Mm. But it's enriched with so many other things that I could never have thought of back then. Mm. And that connection, it has been created by, by life. Mm. by what you're doing, by the people you encounter, by the things you try, being curious for new things that you didn't know existed before. Mm. And they they have enriched my life and have given me um, a lot to be very grateful for. That's beautiful to hear. And I'm I'm really glad. It makes, it literally warms my heart to hear you say that. So that's beautiful. <laughs> um, just uh, one more question on your childhood, because I'm always curious about this question. What smell reminds you of your home back then? And uh, <laughs> and will you share it with us, please? <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it again has to do with my mom. Um, it's uh, sugared almonds uh, straight from the oven. Oh, <laughs> yeah. She uh, she was an avid baker, and we had a lot of cakes and pies on birthdays and stuff like that. So she created this one um, oven dish sized uh, cake with sugared almonds on top, and it's it's um, a common topping for cakes, but mm. I've never had any as good as the ones that my mom made. <laughs> oh, of I course. want to try them so <laughs> badly. Oh. Again, I can remember um, on my birthday each year, my gran, Granny Jean, uh, bless her soul, used to make me some homemade strawberry jam. And it, was, it wasn't like any other jam I'd ever tasted, of course, because she'd made it. Uh, and she'd leave like these beautiful, juicy chunks of strawberries in the jam. So you, you sort of like put it on your bread, but you get like half a strawberry in there as well. And it was just divine. And when I think back now, and I've tried to recreate it, of course, but I can't. Um, it just brings back such happy memories. So thank you so much for sharing that one with us. I'm sure everyone's smelling those sugared almonds right now. <laughs> so bringing you forward into your life to this point, can you remember that first time that you thought, oh my goodness, this is, this is now what I'm doing for a living. Can you describe that moment for us? Yeah, I think the... Um both in my, my career as a magazine designer uh, for publishing agency and with my own magazine is it's that moment that you first get that what you have designed uh, back into your hands. And that's just an, an incredible feeling. And I think that even the first copy of my printed for, of Let's Explore magazine the one that I got out of the box, I think that was emotionally more loaded than the first thing that I've created while working. And I think that's, that has to do with the fact that it's your personal project. Mm. But there's just this finite thing about print. 
it's you cannot have a do-over because once it's printed or when it's at the printer, it's done. Mm. <laughs> um, and I remember going to the printer when they were printing and uh, the sheets coming out of the, the press and uh, it was just a random sheet that they took out from the many sheets that were printed and um, the guy working the press took one of those sheets and carried it to a table to have a look at it and from a distance already I noticed a, a, a fault in <gasps> uh, or an error in the, in the, um, the design. Oh no! And it broke my heart because oh, I Killian, because I also I feel that <laughs> <laughs> because I also knew that I couldn't do uh, have a do over because I ran out of money. Yeah, and there of course there is a way you can uh, fix that and uh, have a do over. But at that point, I figured that no, this is this is part of it, mm. and this is part of printed publications that there is always an error in there. Mm. Um, and it's like this Persian rug where you're looking for that little flaw. It has to be there because otherwise it's just too mechanical. I'm, I'm just trying to imagine because I've got a similar situation. So one of the first albums that I produced, um, there is, <laughs> it makes me cringe because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. <laughs> when I look at it, there is one word in the lyrics that isn't spelt correctly. And every time I look at it, I, I find it really hard to let go of it. It's really... Um, it's a really big exercise in letting go and, and surrendering to the moment, isn't it? Because you just, oh, oh, I, I can't imagine on the scale of a magazine what that would feel like. I just, that that's that's like hearing a scraping sound on a blackboard to me. <laughs> <laughs> what did it teach you? What did it teach you in that moment? Let go. Yeah. Let it go. Because yeah. there's nothing you can do about it. It will not change anything mm. um well errors like these didn't change the meaning of what was written um there's a good chance that nobody else will see it <laughs> because we don't read letter for letter mm. Mm. Uh, we read in in word shapes and even when there's flaws in the design where something is misaligned for instance which makes me cringe there's nobody who's going to notice it's only, it's just me. I, I have this saying in my head that perfect is the enemy of done because when we try and make something perfect, it's like a never ending reason. It's a never ending self-sabotage, isn't it? For just letting something be. Absolutely. I totally agree. And, and letting it be or letting it get to you doesn't mean that you're not careful. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm still working with the same precision and perfectionism with the magazine as ever. I'm just trying, uh, exclamation mark, <laughs> not to let it get to me once it, once it's done and I see an error. Mm. And it's a, it's a something to, to learn with each issue that you create, even when it's not your own money, but somebody else's. I mean, that's your professionalism mm. as well. Mm. Um, but it's not the end of the world. And I also think it, it lends a very human aspect to what you're doing whilst if you create something just digitally or, or something that is computer based, which can correct things for you, which can redesign things for you if you want to, you do lose that element of someone has taken due care and attention to put this together. Someone's heart and soul is in this particular thing, which is why I love books or why I love magazines personally, because that tactile sort of human connection. And if there is an error, you know, from, from an audience perspective, you don't mind like you know if, if there's a spelling mistake or something in the book I'll notice it maybe just like you say maybe I will um, <laughs> but it doesn't detract from the story and if anything else it makes that particular copy of the book or magazine a little bit more endearing because it's got that human element to it that human error element <laughs> and, I, and I also think that you see that for instance with handwritten letters oh or, I love or, a good letter <laughs> Yeah, or, or typewriter um, uh, texts, mm. for instance. I mean, they're, none of them are the same. Mm. And uh, when writing by hand, you can see the difference in pressure or uh, on the pen or the, the difference in speed when somebody's writing. Mm. And I mean, it's, 
there's a reason why the, why you can study reading uh, handwriting uh, and profiling somebody based on their handwriting. Mm. I mean, there's a reason why it's a profession because it's a, a manual, humane um, expression. Mm. Mm. And that human element is something that I find very interesting as well. So that helps me to be okay with an error here and there. <laughs> as long as you're on the receiving end of it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so talking of errors and things like that, what do you consider to be your own sort of personal criteria for success? You need context. Mm. When is something a success? Is that financially? Can you live from what you're doing? Or are you content with what you're creating? I think enough is enough uh, in, a, in a way is something that uh, defines success for me. Even though that I'm a perfectionist in, in some sorts, not striving for something to be perfect uh, feels good for me and feels like a success. Yeah, I agree. And, and, you know, we've touched on that letting go feeling, but truly letting go, like truly surrendering to what's happening in your life. And knowing that, like you rightly say, that it doesn't have to be perfect, that just, you know, sometimes I feel like just getting out of bed is a success. <laughs> Well, and you never and you never know what doors will open when you do something in a different way for once. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and that's what makes it interesting. But you do have to be open for that uh, situation where mm. you just don't know mm. and be okay with that feeling. I'm learning from that now I think in my, in my life and also from what you're saying it kind of gives me a bit of solidarity to know that that's how you feel <laughs> I, I'm not saying that I got it under control I mean it's something that I, I'm striving to live by so that's uh, that's a different story there <laughs> So here you are, you've got this amazing magazine and, you know, people must look at you and think, wow, you know, he's got it all together. But what is one sort of common misconception that people have about you? I think that people think that I have everything under control mm -hmm. and that I'm um, extremely certain of what I'm doing all the time. Yeah. This is something that I've struggled with since my teenage years, I think, is I can be very confident and perhaps coming across a little bit of a little bit arrogant sometimes. Mm, mm. At least that's what I got back uh, to me, uh, thrown back to me in the past. Wow. But it has some, well, that's, uh, that's has something to do with the fact that I want to be brutally honest all the time. That must, yeah, it uh, must be quite hard for people to accept that in that situation sometimes, especially if it's an honesty that that you're showing back to them. Um, yes, and they're they're reacting because of their feelings about themselves, aren't they? Essentially, As, yeah, exactly. So what I've learned, and this has this was a long time ago, is that if you have something to say, you don't necessarily need to say it. Mm. I mean, you can still think of something, but you don't have to express it. What helped me was uh, reflecting on work in art school, for instance. It's you don't have to always have an opinion mm. or have to voice that opinion. You can choose not to. And uh, I know that I'm, I can be very opinionated. And before my teenage years, I wasn't, I didn't find it hard to express what I thought. So mm. if somebody asked for my opinion, they would get my opinion no matter what <laughs> I mean they ask right so <laughs> there you have it but I'm I'm learning to to feel the room and see if my opinion actually contributes something mm. and that's something that I struggle with sometimes and it made me into a different person at one point in my life where I figured, okay, I'm losing friends over here. So what's going on? Mm, mm. Um, and just exploring how my behavior affected those relationships and going from being brutally honest to being a fly on the wall and not participating in any way mm. on the other extreme showed me that that wasn't a solution either. Mm. So 
I'm I'm finding that middle ground and creating the magazine, uh, going to art school where your opinion counts, but you really have to explain why something is the way you think it is. Mm helped me in that sense of finding my voice and finding the right time to voice my opinion. So what do you think is important to you now? Like coming off the back of that question, say to 10 years ago, what do you consider to be important things for you now? And, and what do you sort of focus your time and energy on? Well, first and foremost, health. Mm. Health is absolutely the most important thing I think. And well, I've noticed, well, with my mom, uh, she died from cancer, which is something that in certain ways you can control whether you're uh, in sunshine a lot or not, something like that. But it's not something that you can really control. Mm. So the only thing you can do is try to be as healthy as possible. And without health, there is nothing, which is oversimplifying, I know. But I feel that there is no sense in being unhealthy and not changing that behavior. And that goes for everything as well, doesn't it? Not just necessarily our, our physical health, but also our mental health. Um, Absolutely. It's so important. And I, I think now, maybe more than ever, especially after Corona, people are addressing those questions a little bit more than maybe they they would have time to question before in their day-to-day -day job. Um, do, you, do you feel like that question of, of health or that, that um, use of nature that we've had over the time in Corona, do you think that that's amplified that story within you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, well, I've, I've had the extra time to to run more or do yoga a mm -hmm. little bit more so i'm i'm reaping the benefits from having a healthy lifestyle also when it comes to food for example but mm -hmm. mental health in that sense is another one of those very important aspects of life and i just cannot believe why mental health is still a taboo oh i know it's i i just don't get it. I don't get why we have campaigns trying to get that out of the taboo area because it's part of us. I I once he heard somebody say, well, we take our car to the shop every year to have it tuned. So why don't we have therapy every year mm. just to get our mental health in check? Mm. I mean, that makes so much more sense than bringing your car to the to the to the garage to have it checked because if you're not healthy physically and or mentally yeah what the hell <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i i just don't get why uh mental health is a taboo to talk about because it shouldn't because mm -hmm. that's something that can be worked on and i don't want to use the word fixed but that's the word that pops into my mind now but it shouldn't be a taboo. It should be something that if you struggle with certain thoughts or anxiety or panic attacks, why is it a taboo for people to ask for help? It's, I, I, I really don't get it. I, uh, well, you know, I absolutely wholeheartedly agree being um, in the therapeutic trades uh, in my day job. Um, it's still never ceases to amaze me that people come to me and they go, oh, I've got this problem. And they almost whisper it instead of going, you know what, this is the situation. I want to fix it. It's almost an apology to mm -hmm. be talking about the things that are going on inside of them. And it's, it's, yeah, I really hope that that changes, especially after the year that we've all had. Um, I really hope that it sort of provokes that conversation to move forward with that um, continued embrace and balance of our physical health as well. Talking of mental health, have you ever wanted to quit? Have you ever had to sort of talk yourself off that proverbial ledge? And if so, <laughs> what, what do you say to yourself? Uh, I, I wanted to quit for sure. Uh, and then I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the magazine now that it's just, I know it's such a beautiful project to be working on, 
but it's also very time consuming and it takes a lot of my energy and spare time. Mm. But it's so absolutely worth it that I want to make and create more issues than um, I'm actually capable of at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And last year was, I think, my all-time low where I said, I'm, I'm just not going to do it anymore. Mm. I, I cannot have all these ideas of stuff that I want to create, I want to do, I want to experiment with, but not having the time to actually do it. That's That was so immensely frustrating that I said, well, in that case, I just don't think about it and quit. Mm. And I never had it as strongly as this before. So this really felt like, okay, this was it. This was the end of Let's Explore magazine because I've I've made my decision now. Mm. And not a day or two days later, I got into contact with somebody who read the magazine uh, or wanted to collaborate on something. And I was like, yeah, but this is exactly why I'm making this magazine. (laughs) <laughs> so that got me back on the, on the horse again <laughs> immediately. But it is something that I struggle with every so often because it is something that takes a lot of my time. Mm. And there's there's just so little. And that has something to do with, it's a part of mental health thing as well, where I'm pushing myself to do more because I find everything interesting. Yeah. Um, and I have to really pull myself back uh, or not get involved with something because I know that if I get involved in something new that between then and a couple of hours later, I want to be involved 120%. Mm. And that's just my nature. I That's why curiosity is such a big part of, of this magazine. It's, I find everything fascinating and I want to know more about it which is a hell of a job when there's only 30 hours in a day. (laughs) (laughs) Only 30? Oh my goodness. (laughs) So what have you learned in terms of um, managing that time a little better? Because when you are a curious person, like you rightly say, everything is shiny. You just want to get involved with it and you can get lost down rabbit holes, can't you, in in what you're curious with. So how are you sort of prioritizing your time now? What, What tips can you give other people that may be thinking of starting a creative project like yours? So what I'm looking into is really creating blocks to work on something. And this is a very personal way of working because I just need a little bit more time to get going in the Mm -hmm. day. Uh, For instance, I know that I'm more productive in the afternoon and the evenings. Mm. So that means that in the mornings I try to do other stuff that are a little bit more tedious and don't need my full concentration. Mm. It really helped me to really set certain hours a day where I can work on being curious and just let my mind go. And whether I'm productively writing emails to people who are contributing or looking at uh, cat videos on YouTube, I don't (laughs) care because that's my time to be with myself and my curiosity and embracing whatever happens. I love that you call it like your time to play. I think you know, when when we become adults, that word play seems to be a taboo word that's just left for children. But it's so important, especially if you've got a creative mindset, to allow your imagination out of the box and uh, just to go wherever it likes. Talking of which, I'm going to ask you a couple of playful questions. So if your life was a movie, what would three of the songs be on the soundtrack? And, uh, you know, what would they be and why? I've been thinking about one from my childhood. Uh, This has to do with my upbringing from my dad, uh, who was very much or is very much into music. And he was uh, pretty much the DJ on all my birthday parties. Oh, cool. Up (laughs) up until I was uh, 22, 23, Mm. something like that. It was always, yeah, after (laughs) after 1 or 2 a.m., my friends uh, started to ask, when is your dad starting to play the music so i think uh in that sense bohemian rhapsody from queen has to be uh on the soundtrack as Mm. well nice and um 
But that also reminds me of my mom again saying that that was the first song that I had an emotional connection with Mm. in terms of I was too young to understand what the song was about, but I could feel what the song was about. (laughs) And she told me that we were going on holiday and I was sitting in the back of the car and I asked my parents why the man in the song was so sad. Oh. And this was when I was, I don't know, seven or eight. That's so insightful. It was, yeah. So that's something. And thinking now back to mental health issues and people apologizing for having um, uh, uh, an issue in one way or another, I think that is also a shame that people still need to feel the need to apologize when they're crying. Mm. Because there's nothing better than a good cry. And I've experienced that over the past couple of years, uh, a couple of times, and it just helps deal with certain emotions. And I know from um, my musical upbringing that songs or music have that effect on me often. There's a couple of songs that get me to cry every single time and just let it go because it's a wonderful feeling. And that's the thing, isn't it? It is a wonderful feeling to let your emotions go. And I know that a lot of the time we have to sort of keep ourselves together for public viewing, if you like, um, (laughs) or just to present ourselves in a way we hope people will see us as. But when you actually allow yourself to let go with with that emotional um, prompt from a particular song it really does release so much and you learn about yourself in the process yeah totally agree which uh, which actually brings me to uh, a second song that i got reminded of a couple of days ago actually thank you facebook for um sending me uh, <laughs> the, my my memory is uh home from mark broussard the memory I got from Facebook was actually um, a concert I went to from Mark Bussard in a, a small church uh, here in the Netherlands. Wow. And um, this was the song that he was playing. But I remember that the last song that he did, he did a cappella. Oh, wow. Um, and there was, were only 200 or 300 people in the, in the venue. It was incredible. I think I cried the entire concert, actually. <laughs> There's, there is a song on that particular album, and I think it might be the one that he did at acapella, which is about his mum, I think, um, uh, or his, his girlfriend. I can't remember now because I haven't listened to it for so long. And thank you for bringing that song up so I can go back <laughs> and revisit it. But every time I listen to it, I cry just from the lyrical point of view. Um, it's, it's so good that you brought up that memory because I discovered him when I was in America and um, there was a massive lightning and thunderstorm going on outside. And I ran into the nearest shop, which happened to be a music shop, and uh, to pass this lightning storm away. And Mark Broussard was on on one of the sort of headstands with the headphones and I'd never heard of him. So I just said, oh, okay, I'll go and check this guy out and uh, and discovered him. And so every time that song is mentioned or brought up, I'm brought back to that thunderstorm in the States and, and running into that shop. So thank you so much for mentioning him. You're very I welcome. I love that. <laughs> I want to talk to you about um, books. I'm a big bookworm. And uh, one of the questions that I'd like to ask you, which I think I know how you're going to react, but um, <laughs> what would be the book that you would never lend And what is that book and how did it impact you? So, and this is where, again, context comes into play. (laughs) A book that has such a profound um, meaning for you, for me in this sense, would also be a book that I would like to share with others. So I don't (laughs) think there would be any book that I wouldn't (laughs) want to lend to anybody else. You're so much less selfish than I am. (laughs) And and even if it's a book that I wouldn't like, I just gave it away. So it's still not lending the book. <laughs> what is that book? I'm intrigued now. Uh, the book Mouse from Art Spiegelman. I've never heard of that book. It's a, it's a graphic novel. It's similar to Animal Farm, where oh. animals are used for um, characters of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, to make that relationship. And in Mouse, they use mice where uh, we follow a family during World War II, a Mm. Jewish family, and uh, how they survive and what the dynamics are in the family and how they survive and what this means for the future. And 
it was the first book where I, for the first time, experienced storytelling in a way that it was able to convey the story without being graphic. Mm. In the sense that it's weird that you can relate to a drawn mouse in that <laughs> sense and that you can be emotionally touched by a drawing mm. uh, which is a story which is a cartoon which is a comic book and this introduced me i think for the first time in the power of storytelling and um how different themes or different handwritings can alter how uh, a story is brought to a viewer or reader mm. or listener I really, I can't wait to to check that out, and I will absolutely drop it into um, the the Brave Moment Bookshop collection so that people can find it and uh, experience it for themselves. Thank you for that. That sounds so intriguing. I'm very curious. You sparked my curiosity now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and again, when it comes to music, it's uh, for me linked to Saint Germain. As, oh, brilliant! Uh, so every time that I hear songs from them, I think of that book. In a wow. way, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Oh, Our music that. finds its way through uh, through everything, really. The podcast is called The Brave Moment. And I'm really curious uh, as to what you consider to be your bravest moment, be that either, you know, spiritually, personally or emotionally, or how even asking that question uh, makes your mind tick. <laughs> Publishing my own magazine is probably the bravest thing I've ever done. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just the entire process of creating it finding the courage to ask people to participate basically knowing that they will say no mm. being surprised every once in a while of course but putting myself out there in this way creating something which is mine uh knowing that uh 10 people liking it will be um uh, destroyed by one people not liking the magazine mm. just putting myself on the spot and I think that is that could be my bravest moment and especially just starting with that first issue and what a moment I mean trying to figure that out and trying to find all the avenues to create <laughs> that I mean I know that obviously in your job you do have a little bit of expertise in that arena but it's it's incredibly brave to do anything like that whether you're you know a photographer or an artist or whoever you are in the creative industries putting yourself forward like that um in into the public space especially where you can be judged so harshly um sometimes and and hoping that beauty will be returned to you that's that's a massive deal and probably a lot bigger than uh, than most people realize and i'm curious to to know how it felt just the next day how did it feel when you did have that magazine in your hands and it gone out into the world and it was successful and, and beautiful people found it how did that make you feel inside it was a roller coaster because there's at the end of the journey of a single issue there's these different moments where you are overjoyed mm. because you know there's this moment of sheer joy when you send it to the printer and mm -hmm. then you know two or three weeks later you receive the first issues on your doorstep mm. which is with the very first issue actually literally made me cry because it was such a long journey to create it um, knowing that my mom would have never would never see that issue it was just such an emotional thing mm. um and then a couple of days later sending it out into the world and then the agony of waiting for people to reply or respond to to what you've created and uh, luckily nine out of ten people loved the the publication and hold on to it <laughs> with the, for their life <laughs> so that's yeah that's absolutely wonderful and that's what keeps me going 
Oh, it just, it's filling me with such a warm feeling inside. And I know that everyone listening to this will just be so curious about you after this uh, interview and, and everything that you represent. And um, it's been such a pleasure to to talk to you about your journey and what the magazine means to you and, and hearing the heart behind it. It's, it's a beautiful thing to share with us. So thank you for that. Um, I've got just a couple of questions left before I, I let you get on with your evening. Um Talking of, you know, your mum passing away and not being able to see this first beautiful creation that is solely yours, what do you hope people will be saying about you and your life's work when you've passed away? And what legacy are you hoping to leave behind? Um, I I hope that people get inspired by what I do and open up to listen to what others have to say, because that's something that I'm trying to do myself. Mm. And the work that I'm doing with the magazine is trying to materialize my curiosity and and leave that behind for others to explore as well and take it further than what I've done up until now. Mm. That's a really good and inspiring answer as well. And I hope that people (laughs) listen to that and take it on board when they're thinking about the legacy that they're leaving behind themselves. for those other people that are thinking of creating something for themselves, be that written, filming or, or whatever, what important advice can you give them and, and what questions should they ask themselves? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> it's that easy. Just um, what I what I tell myself sometimes is that it's very easy to come up come up with reasons not to do something. Mm. Just come up with one reason to actually do it. And I'm noticing for myself that that reason is so much more profound than any reason I can think of not to do something. I think that would be my advice. If you're if you need a little push uh, when just do it is not enough. <laughs> Make a list, Ask your, uh, tell yourself three reasons why you shouldn't do it and then come up with one reason why you should do it and see what happens. How does it make you feel? I think that's a great exercise for, for everything in life, be it creative or not. Uh, when we make those big decisions, what a great way to look at things because we do, we do naturally go to the negative and we do uh, self-sabotage our creativity in that way because we might feel it's it's silly or it won't live up to other people's expectations or, you know, maybe family members might put you down for, for trying your uh, crazy idea out. And that's all external. Exactly, exactly. And uh, if they took your advice and fingers crossed, they'll come up with more reasons to create. Finally, I can't believe I'm on this last question. I don't want to let you go. Um, From all that you've seen every day through Corona, through your life so far, what advice would you like to give to the world right now as we're coming out of this lockdown period and back into reality? I put in quote marks. (laughs) (laughs) I would say start listening. Mm. To, to others, not just hearing what people are saying, but actually listening. And if you talk to people, don't talk to them or ask them questions and wait for when it's your turn again to speak, but really listen to what people are saying. Because I'm noticing when I'm listening to people that there's more to it than what they're saying. Mm. And perhaps it's a taboo of sorts, But start listening would be my uh, advice, I think. And that's absolutely wonderful, wonderful advice, Killian. Thank you so, so much for all that you've offered us today. It's been an absolute treat to have you on the show. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's such a pleasure. And I'm going to drag you back on at some point. I'm sorry, but that's happening. (laughs) (laughs) That's perfectly fine by me. (laughs) So if people want to read more about the magazine, if they want to follow you online and just learn a little bit about you as a person, because I know that on your uh, your homepage, you do tell your story in your own words for people to sort of visually see. Where can they find you and what should they be Googling? Well, the easiest would be to go to letsexplore.magazine.com. And from there, uh, um, uh, you can be redirected to uh, the different socials on uh, Twitter and Instagram 
although I'm not that active at the moment because I'm creating another issue of the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> but let's explore magazine.com would be um, the safest place to go. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Killian. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Looking <laughs> forward to the next one. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Killian's Magazine is an experience rather than just something you buy to pass the time. Full to the brim with beautiful imagery and experiential storytelling from all walks of life, Killian has facilitated something that you would want to keep on your bookshelf rather than throw away when you're finished with it. And this is down to Killian's intention to create a magazine in a mindful manner, to not limit the storytellers to one group of people, but to reach out to the entire world to find the stories to fill the umbrella heading of each issue. This year, the issue covers empowerment, and I can't wait to see what Killian has discovered about the human experience when I get to purchase the magazine later in the year when it is ready, of course. Just imagine if all magazines were created mindfully in a way such as Killian's. What a joy to see a row of publications that solely lift people up, that teach you about others, but also about yourself. And you're not bombarded with adverts or things designed to make you feel insecure about yourself. I hope that Killian's bravery to create with integrity and honour catches on and changes the whole publishing landscape so that it flows in a more natural and authentic way. Authors of books work in this way, and so why not everything else that we read vocationally? In line with Killian's question to himself of asking, does my opinion contribute something to the space that I'm in? Let's Explore magazine expresses his opinion as an echo. He is the creator, but he allows the contributors to take centre stage. And he explores it with others in that moment of thinking it. He is the facilitator of conversation rather than the sole point of view that we hear the story from. And Killian knows that this is integral to the magazine's success and style. This ties in nicely with what he has also learned on a personal note about himself and that finding the balance between expressing an honest opinion or not speaking your opinion at all are equally futile. And so finding that middle ground between observation and vocalisation is the best place for people to receive information. Balance is an important word for both Killian the person and Killian the mindful storyteller. We talk a little bit about perfection and how it can sabotage one's success. Killian has learned that the finite form of print is a cruel mistress, exposing every flaw that your human eye has missed. But in the frustration that this creates in the moment, it also allows for personal growth. Once it's done, it's done. And actually, the flaw of a misprint or layout can lend that human quality to an otherwise mechanical process. The Japanese Zen practitioners call this acceptance and transcendence over imperfection wabi-sabi, something that all artists have to contend with and surrender to at some point in their career, usually with the increase of their skill set and when imperfection becomes more noticeable to them. Killian's biggest challenge, now that he has overcome imperfection, is patience and resilience. To create takes a lot of personal time and energy, and there's a lot of stress, anxiety and management of others that plays into Killian's journey to create a magazine on his own terms. And he mentions that with each passing issue, these things are tested daily, be it through contributors waiting until the last minute to produce their story in full, or whether balancing his other work as a publisher and designer for external clients. But with each issue there will be an interaction that reminds him exactly why he is doing it, why he enjoys it, and equally why he is so dedicated and passionate about it. With purpose comes predicaments to overcome, and as long as you remain passionate about what you're doing, you will find a way. As Killian says, it is in our nature to find many things to stop us from beginning or achieving, but all you need is one thing. One reason to do it. And if that isn't enough, make a list. And he's right. All you need is one thing. Taking this podcast as an example, there are many reasons that could stop me from showing up each week. From the fact that it's a lot of time and effort literally for free, or that it takes days to edit, uh, that it's frustrating for my husband if I too leave things to the last minute. But that one thing that keeps me going is you. 
the people that listen, the legacy for the guests that may not be given the opportunity to share their experience on a larger platform such as television or national radio, and for those just starting out in the arts, not knowing if they are even worth the gamble, that is reason enough for me. And hearing your stories and your thoughts on each one is priceless in my creative process. Killian, when he held that first magazine of his, fresh out of the delivery box, when he cried with joy at his creation, that passion and love that he feels, I also feel, in the telling of his story. For that is why we do this. To feel, to share and to tell our stories. If you can't find a reason, let me lend you that one. The world needs your art your passionate expression, so that we as a collective can pass on our stories when we no longer walk on the planet. Killian knows just how valuable that reason is, the finite nature of print. Its documentation of story may allow someone else who has lost someone dear to remain in some way on this earth for a son, a daughter, a friend or a nephew, to see and read about who they were when they're no longer here. Killian, like us all, is in the process of preserving someone's precious existence, wisdom and life experience one magazine at a time. And in doing so, he revives his own relationship with his mother, their own story and her imparted motivation, curiosity and love that took his idea to its fruition. Talking of curiosity, let that be your other reason to have faith in your art – Aren't you curious to see what you could create if you followed your idea? How that spark may catch fire? Everything we know, everything we see has been created by those that have followed their curiosity and imagination to create an idea in the world. From our cars to our buildings to our music to our art, you're listening right now because that curiosity burns inside of you. And if you give it the space to grow, who knows what might happen? Killian created a whole new way of publishing because he believed in an idea and was compelled to create it. As Albert Einstein once said, I am neither clever or especially gifted. I am only very, very curious. Next week, we have our first two-part special with tsunami survivor Steph Hill. She talks to us about her experience and how this incredibly brave moment not only changed her life, but the entire course of her career. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the show. If you have a spare moment now, please like, subscribe and tell me your thoughts in a review on Apple Podcasts, which will really help other people like yourself to find the show. Of course, you can also share the show with your friends by following us at The Brave Moment Podcast on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube or on Twitter at Moment Brave or just follow the link tree on all of our social media platforms. It's been so wonderful to have you all here with me again. Please get in touch with your own stories and remember, your brave moment starts now.